Well, the problem in Buddhism is suffering. And it presents an analysis of suffering. And it says if we understand why we suffer, the origins of suffering, then we can reverse it. And we can learn not to suffer. We can figure out ways to be in the world without suffering, which is, is nirvana. Literally means blowing out. It's the blowing out of suffering. And it's blowing out of the ignorance that causes suffering and blowing out of the ego that causes suffering and blowing out of the, the craving that causes suffering. So it is a kind of more psychological religion in the sense that it aims at things that we think maybe psychotherapy aims at, of being happy of being less sad, of, of having less sorrow in our lives. Mm. Some people wonder if Confucianism is a philosophy or a religion, and there have been some people who've wondered if Buddhism is psychotherapy or religion, or a little bit of both. That's right, and I think both Buddhism and Confucianism challenge our notions of what religion is. And Buddhism does that by saying you can have a religion without a god. And people who want to say, well, okay, religion's about God, then they have to say, well, Buddhism isn't a religion. And yet, if you go around Asia and see the places in East Asia or in Southeast Asia where you have Buddhists, they sure look pretty religious. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think uh, what we've learned to do as scholars of religion is to say, well, we were wrong when we said that religion needs to have a god or a creator god or even supernatural beings in order to, to be a religion because Buddhism doesn't necessarily have those things. Do any Buddhists believe in God? Well, the classic answer is that the God proposition is not useful. The, the question in Buddhism isn't really what's the reality of the world. The question is how to get rid of suffering. And so if you ask a question like, is there a God? The Buddhist question in response to that question is, is answering that question either way going to make me less or more sad, less or more sorrowful, less or more in pain? And what the Buddha says is the God question is a question not leading to edification. In other words, it doesn't help. So don't ask it. And so I think classically Buddhists have not really been atheists. They've been agnostics in the sense of not even that they don't know whether there's a God, but they just don't care. And they think that asking that question gets you, gets you in trouble. Now, now, now that said, as the tradition develops, the Buddhas and other heroes in the tradition start to look a lot like gods. They can do miracles. They can sh send you to the pure land, which gives you nirvana. Like they can do the most fabulous, fascinating, um, supernatural sorts of things. And so they really function a lot like gods in the Buddhist tradition. Now, Buddhism does have something called the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. Do you want to say what those are? This is uh, the story of the Buddha where he's – you know, he's in this fabulous palace. He has all this money. He's got this gorgeous wife. He's got this kid. Set this in time. When, when is that? Well, this is back in either the 5th or the 6th century BCE in northern India. And he's dissatisfied. And so he leaves and he goes wandering around and he tries to figure out the source of his suffering. And finally, he sits under this tree in northern India. And he... Uh, realizes the roots of his own suffering and the roots of human suffering. And that's really the Four Noble Truths, which, which are basically, um, number one, humans suffer. Uh, number two, suffering has an origin. Um, we suffer because we're ignorant. We suffer because we desire um, things that we can't have. We have ignorant craving. And then that suffering can, can be reversed and we can get rid of it. And the getting rid of it can lead us to nirvana, which is the fourth element there, the blowing out of suffering. So it's a very much a cause and effect kind of argument here in the Four Noble Truths. And, and the Noble Eightfold Path is, is the getting rid of, right? It's saying, look, you can get rid of it through ethics. You can get rid of it through spiritual disciplines. But the, the, the key to it that has been distilled over the over time in the Buddhist tradition is either chanting or meditation. So you're going to Yes, lead an ethical life, but the, the core is going to be some kind of what we would call spiritual practice or contemplative practice that's going to get you to realize that yourself doesn't exist in the way that you wanted, that the craving never gets you what you really hope for. And if it does, it often makes you, you know, less happy than you were before. You mentioned Buddhists practice meditation. It, is there a particular form that meditation takes in Buddhism, a particular mode, or is it fairly diverse? Well, let me say to start that there's a lot of Buddhists actually who don't meditate. A lot of my students who come from East Asia and Southeast Asia, 
um, look to monks to meditate, in other, especially if they come from Theravada countries, which is the oldest form of Buddhism that we see in South and Southeast Asia. There, there's a sense that monks are the ones who really try to get the religious goal of nirvana. What we do is try to get the proximate goal of a better rebirth because only monks can get the real thing. So it's really more in the Mahayana Buddhism, this other form of Buddhism that we see in North Asia – that's a newer form, newer than the Theravada, the older one, where ordinary people feel that they can get the religious goal of nirvana in their lifetime and they don't need to defer to monks to do that. And, and what they're going to do is a lot of different strategies. You know, there are – I mean the, the simplest one is vipassana meditation that's popular particularly in southern Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism where you just – are mindful of what's going on. And the most basic way of being mindful of what's going on is following your breath, you know, every given moment. Um, and that's vipassana. There's also meditation that's called metta meditation that's, that's more about compassion. And those are kind of focusing on, in a way, the two great Buddhist virtues of wisdom on the one hand, seeing the world as it really is, and then compassion, being empathetic in, in, in both feeling and action toward other human beings. Is there such a thing as worship in Buddhist temples? Well... Again, you have to look at these two main forms of Buddhism. In the oldest form, the Theravada form from the south, I, I would say largely no. The argument is that the Buddha is not to be worshipped, that all we have here is human beings. Uh, we don't have gods. But pretty quickly in Buddhism, we develop this other form, the Mahayana form. And in that form, we have Buddhas and we have these figures called bodhisattvas who are embodiments of wisdom and compassion and with particularly compassion and they are worshipped because the thought is is that those beings, those Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can transfer merit to you. They can – this is a karma world, right, where things are driven by the law of karma where, you know, you do good, good comes back to you. Is there a holy book or books in Buddhism? Well, there are many sutras. Um, sutras is the term, typically the sayings of the Buddha. And Buddhists have different understandings of those. There are divisions, particularly in Mahayana Buddhism, that are very much around which scripture you read. Where did the Buddha really speak? You know, is he speaking in the Heart Sutra? Is he speaking in the Lotus Sutra? So there are an overabundance of scriptures mm -hmm. in the Buddhist tradition. And much of it, much of the arguments have to do, have to do with, you know, which scripture do you account as closest to the real Buddha, the life mm -hmm. of the Buddha? Now, as to the basic beliefs of Buddhism, again, I don't think there's anything we would probably call a creed, but I know you say that at least the most ancient tradition, there's a focus on the individual or the self and basically ridding the self of suffering. But on the other hand, the self doesn't really exist. <laughs> How can you explain this? Yeah, this is the bet. This is one of the wonderful pieces of Buddhism. It's one of the actually hardest things for me as a teacher when I do a world religions course with my students at Boston University. You know, how do you explain to them this idea? And I, I think the simplest is Buddhism is growing out of Hinduism, and Hinduism has the idea of the soul, which they call the Atman, and Buddhists reject the idea. So we can kind of understand that because we have materialists, for example, in Western society, atheists, who will say, well, we don't have souls, right? Mm -hmm. But the tradition argues more than that. It says we don't have a self. And I think this is a more important idea. And, the, and the, key, the key thing here is that when we think of ourselves, we think of ourselves as independent beings who are non-composites. Now, this is all sounds kind of crazy philosophical, but the Buddhist point to it is you don't want to suffer. And when you think you are an independent self-existing ego apart from other human beings and apart from the ecological world around us, then you suffer. And that's the point, is egoism will drive you crazy. So don't think of yourself in this way. And when it comes to the afterlife, if you could call it that, nirvana, the absence of suffering, Buddhists go through belief in reincarnation or rebirth, and that can happen several times, can it not, before one reaches nirvana? That's right. And it's important to note that nirvana isn't an afterlife. It isn't an afterlife grab, you know. Um, nirvana can happen uh, here and now. And so it isn't like, I think because we think of uh, heaven, we sort of think we die and we go to heaven. So we sort of think we die and we get nirvana. But nirvana is actually something that can be realized here and now. That said, the tradition does affirm reincarnation. It gets it from Hinduism. Mm 
it becomes a little tricky because in Hinduism, the notion of reincarnation is that the Atman, the soul, recycles from life to life, so rebirth to rebirth. In Buddhism, they reject the Atman, so, and yet they have reincarnation. So what's reincarnated? And this is where Buddhists of different kinds of Buddhism are going to disagree. But one basic idea is that we have consciousness, and our consciousness is going to move from body to body. And so if you look at, say, the Vajrayana tradition, the, the Tibetan tradition of the Dalai Lama, the idea is, is that our consciousness reincarnates so that the Dalai Lama is a reincarnation of the prior Dalai Lama who is a reincarnation of the Dalai Lama before him. And they go around and they sort of try to find the consciousness of that person in part by like giving them the to- like toys that as a little boy the prior Dalai Lama played with. And if they go to the, the, go to the right toys... Um, then there's some evidence that that may be the same person. But it is a reincarnation tradition, and, it, and that comes from Hinduism. Mm-hmm. And Buddhism is also a missionary religion, right? That's right. I mean, and, you know, Buddhist, Buddhism is, is the fourth largest religion in the world after Christianity, Islam, and then uh, Hinduism. So there is this idea that the Buddha, after he achieved his enlightenment, he sort of said to himself— all right, I just learned something through my own experience that can only be learned through experience. What good is it for me to go tell somebody? Because immediately it's going to get flattened out. It's going to be misunderstood. It's going to, it's going to be degraded as soon as I start to talk about the experience because the experience is beyond words. And, and, and he's tempted to just go wander off into silence. So there would have been this sort of silent Buddhism out there in, in this one human being. But he says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to teach it and I know that I'll be misunderstood. But I'm going to teach it. And so he goes to Sarnath, which is in North India, and he preaches and he tries to make converts. He says, look, here's the way I understand the world to be. This is what my awakened mind sees the world as. Try it and see if, if it's right. Try and see if, if, it, if it eliminates your suffering because it eliminated my suffering. Mm. And ever since then, Buddhists have gone out to the whole world with that message, with that Dharma message. And finally, why is Buddhism becoming increasingly popular in North America? And in your book, you also say Australia and New Zealand. I think the thing that attracts us about Buddhism is it gives us spirituality without God. And the way to say it maybe more broadly is it gives us spirituality without religion. I mean, now Buddhism is a religion, but the way that Americans appropriate in the West is more in terms of its contemplative practices. So we kind of get this, this amazing tradition that has thought for 2,500 years about what techniques can we use to eliminate suffering? What techniques can we use for, for individual spiritual contemplation? And we're able to borrow those without this sort of sense of God, revelation, prophets, required rituals, things like that. And that seems really freeing to a lot of Americans. And I think that's part of the source of its popularity.